listener note, this episode contains some adult language and themes. Before Aaron Hernandez became a star in the NFL, before he was on trial for murder, he was a kid growing up in Bristol, Connecticut. Jeff Morgan coached his high school football team. He was a wide receiver at that time, his first year. You know, he was unbelievably fast and the body on him, he was almost like had the body of a senior. He really wasn't a freshman. Morgan was an assistant coach at Bristol Central during Aaron Hernandez's freshman and sophomore seasons, and he was a self-described disciplinarian. And my philosophy was no swearing on the field. In Hernandez's sophomore year, he broke that rule. And like I said, that was a no-no in my book on the field. So I told him immediately, I said, when practice is over, meet me on the hill. All the players knew what that meant. The hill was next to the school. Being ordered to run that bluff was a pretty typical punishment. And when practice was over, all the other players went in and they were laughing at him. And he took off his helmet and his shoulder pads and he got on his knees and he said, please coach, don't make me run. That's when Morgan pulled out his cell phone. I said, if you don't start running, I'm calling your father. So then he took off up the hill. (laughs) To his coach, it showed respect. Hernandez's father seemed strict. Well, I believe his father was hard on him because he wanted him and his brother to excel in sports. He he stayed on him as far as his schoolwork because he wanted him to have good grades. Aaron respected his father. But there were warning signs that this was something altogether more serious. I know one time he went to a senior dance as a freshman, and I guess he was drinking before he went to the dance, and they threw him out of the dance at the school. And then the next time we saw him, he looked like that. You know, I guess his father did discipline him some. More than some? Uh, He had a black eye. I'm assuming that's where that came from. In a call from jail later in life, Aaron Hernandez remembered his volatile home. I grew up in a household full of fucking arguing 24-7, fighting all that shit. Yeah, I know. In the Hernandez home, violent physical abuse was a frightening fact of life. From the Boston Globe and Wondery, I'm Bob Holer, and this is Gladiator an investigative series about Aaron Hernandez and Football, Inc. This is episode two, Bristol. Welcome to Bristol, nestled in the heart of Connecticut, just two hours from... Bristol, Connecticut is a former industrial city in the middle of the state, not far from Hartford. It's now a middle-class suburb with a rich sports history. Babe Ruth and Satchel Paige played there and it's home to the world headquarters of ESPN. It's also where Aaron Hernandez was born and grew up. My spotlight colleague, Beth Healy, picks up the story. Jonathan Hernandez says his parents always wanted him and Aaron to be a part of Bristol sports history. Aaron's older brother and his only sibling, Jonathan, has a book coming out. It's called The Truth About Aaron, And he shares for the first time new details about what it was like growing up in their family. My mom had an early age that if if it's not for sports, you're going to be going to that community college. Football was a ticket to something bigger. I just used to look at it like, I I want better than that. (laughs) And you look at options at at that age, you're just, you're committed to what your parents throw you into. In many ways, Jonathan and Aaron looked up to their father, Dennis. Dennis Hernandez was a star athlete at Bristol Central High School in the 1970s, the same school Jonathan and Aaron would go on to attend. Many people still knew Dennis by the nickname he'd earned in high school. They called him the King. Dennis had grown up in a working class family with Puerto Rican roots, and he earned a scholarship to play football at the University of Connecticut. It was supposed to be a way to a better life. But Dennis Hernandez did not finish college. In 1977, one of his football friends broke into a house, got caught, and his accomplice ended up shooting a police officer. While Dennis was not involved in the burglary or the shooting, he later admitted that he had tried to help the shooter flee the scene. He was never charged with anything, but he dropped out of Yukon. Dennis went back to Bristol 
and became known around the city for his charisma. The king was charming, generous, gregarious. People said fatherhood made him a better man. He settled into domestic life in a small ranch-style house on a tree-lined street with his wife, Terry, a school secretary. Dennis became a janitor at the other high school in town. But he still lived on the edge. He would stay out late drinking with friends. When Aaron was three, Dennis was arrested for allegedly trying to buy cocaine from an undercover officer. Jonathan Hernandez says his father instilled in the boys a love of sports and a lot of fear. You know, playing the little, uh, you know, Fisher Price basketball in house and thinking of the little, you know, makeshift uh, hoop my dad made with, you know, yarn in, in a paper bag from Stop and Shop, playing in the three and one hockey, you know, the, the three and one set. You, know, you flip it over, it's a nice hockey thing, and, and I have a one stick because we were getting chased by our father, about to get abused. It was Aaron and Jonathan together in the house. Throughout their lives, people would sometimes mistake them for each other. When they were younger, Jonathan recalls, Aaron would spike up his hair like a porcupine. And he had these like these dimples that just really looked like half of his cheeks were missing because his dimples were so caved in so far. It was just and he just really just brightened up my day. Jonathan says they argued and fought like brothers do, but they loved each other. And they stuck together through their father's beatings. It was violent, very. Um, I know people have had it harder than me. And I'm here having a conversation with you. Um. But it got so bad that at one time, Jonathan, then known as DJ, says he threatened to call the authorities. I picked up the phone once to call to seek help. And... His response was pretty much, call them. And he handed me the phone and he said, "Um, I'm going to beat you even harder, you and your brother. And they're going to have to pull me off of you when they knock down the door. Jonathan says he would stay out late, shooting hoops in the dark to avoid coming home. Yeah, and then you start thinking, what would happen if I got a B? I'm going home, I'm hiding under my bed. Or C, I'm hiding under my bed because what's about to happen? It left the two boys with a complicated relationship with their father. You know, you're in school and you see someone act up or someone not do well or this or that, and you're like, they didn't get beat enough. They revered him, but according to Jonathan, they were constantly afraid of what he'd do. He said his father's excessive drinking played a role in his violence. I love my dad to death. I, I do. I, I do. I love him. Um, with all my heart, it's just the reality of, of the way we grew up. Their mom, Terry Valentine, graduated two years after Dennis from Bristol Central. She was a baton-twirling majorette. A quote under her senior picture describes her as a sophisticated lady. Terry married the king in August 1986, three months after Jonathan was born. But the home wasn't a stable one. When Aaron was nine, his parents filed for bankruptcy protection. And then things got uglier, as Aaron remembered later in one of the jail calls the Spotlight team uncovered. That's what you did, That's what you did when I was in seventh grade when the feds busted in our house, too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I remember I was doing uh, I was doing homework. Yeah. And I was crying downstairs. Terry Hernandez was wanted in connection with an illegal sports betting ring she helped run out of the family's home. Yeah. And they busted in the doors, and then poor DJ had to be brought home by Winninger and with all the FBI there. <laughs> right after his basketball practice. Was- she later cooperated with authorities and was never charged. This happened when Aaron was 11 years old and his brother was 14. It wasn't always clear that Aaron would play football. When he was extremely young, he he wasn't necessarily always interested in sports. At first, he didn't seem drawn to the game that meant so much to his father. In fact... He wanted to be a cheerleader. My cousins were cheerleaders. I remember coming home and my dad put an end to that really quick. It was not okay. 
And my dad made it clear that he had his definition of a man. Their dad pushed football. And he pushed Aaron and Jonathan to work hard and be better. He took them to gyms and chased them around to keep them running, made them run drills. Jonathan began playing organized football in a Bristol youth league. You know, my brother's a little too young to participate. And he's, you know, on the side, you know, going to get some, you know, Twizzlers at the, the concession stand and running around with other kids and enjoying life. At the time, it seemed like Jonathan was destined to continue his father's football legacy, not his younger brother. Jonathan says he and Aaron were constantly being reminded by their father of what was okay and what wasn't for a man to do. You know, my father, and I hate to say this, I do not meet offense to anyone, but, you know, faggot was used all the time in our house. All the time. Standing, talking, acting, looking. It was the furthest thing you, my father wanted you to even look like in our household. That was not acceptable to him. The way you stand, the way, everything. Um, How you place your hands. That looks feminine, that doesn't. You can't stand that way. Jonathan says his dad's words had a profound effect on Aaron. The person you look up to, you're, 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 that's your father, that's your king. And Aaron had something else weighing on him, something he apparently didn't disclose to his family or anyone else until years later. Aaron was sexually molested as a young boy, according to one of his lawyers and his brother. When we asked Jonathan about it, he said he wasn't ready to offer details. He also said he has not confronted the alleged abuser. This is something that people go through, and it's stuff you don't wish upon anyone. Um, changes the way you know you live, you think, uh, how guarded you become. Um, it's just something that you don't wish for anyone. Aaron kept these painful memories to himself for most of his life, and he set his mind to playing football the thing that brought him accolades at school and gave him his best chance at impressing his father. Did you know that 66% of men start losing their hair by age 35? That's not a fun statistic to think about, but it also doesn't have to be scary. You just need to tackle this thing early because it's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost. And thanks to HIMS, that's H-I-M-S, you can turn to science. 4 is a one-stop shop for hair loss and skin care for men. They connect you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. Getting started is easy. You answer a few quick questions, a doctor reviews your profile, and products are shipped directly to your door. As a listener of this show, you can get a trial month of HIMS for just $5 today while supplies last. Take a look at the website for full details. This is an incredible deal. It would cost you hundreds if you went to a doctor or a pharmacy. So go to forhims.com slash gladiator. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash gladiator. One more time. That's forhims.com slash gladiator to get a trial month of hymns for just five dollars. It was at a football practice early in their lives that Aaron Hernandez first met Dennis Sansusi. I knew him from flag football. Sansusi would later be the quarterback on Aaron's high school team. And right away, I was good on my team, he was good. The difference is he continued to grow. It was already clear that Aaron had a lot of athletic talent. He was gifted at a very young age, but he really grew into a beast and like a year or two later. I don't think size is everything when it comes to playing football. That's Dennis's father, Tim. But I think it's helpful. You know, Aaron was just a head taller than every other kid his age, a step or two quicker and faster and just stronger and bigger than everyone. So when you're out there playing football, It's kind of nice to be bigger than everybody else. Tim coached one of the youth teams. 
I had plans to teach the kids some of the basic th things of football. But he quickly ran into interference from Aaron's dad. Remember, he was also named Dennis. And Dennis more felt like what we should do, because they were so young, was not focus on some of that stuff and maybe just do a run right, run left, and, and, and really a much more basic kind of a thing. Well, he was down at the store kind of telling Marty, you know, that I, I may not have the right ideas moving forward. And of course, like the young, foolish person that I was at times, uh, I got a little overly upset about that. I called him up and let him know uh, in no uncertain terms that I didn't need his help. Well, uh, the conversation didn't go well. A few weeks later, Tim approached Dennis about it. You know, it's time to kind of shake hands and bury the hatchet, right? Hey, no hard feelings. And Dennis came walking off the field one day down at the midget football field there. And I had reached out my hand to shake with him and said, hey, no hard feelings. And, you know, I kind of just did one of these numbers where he didn't look at me, didn't talk to me, kind of kept walking. And me being the person that I am that has to say the one thing that's just too much. And I says to him, I says, uh, Dennis, why are you being such an asshole about this? Well, he promptly turned around and clocked me one uh, across the face, broke my glasses uh, off my face. The police came, and no one was more surprised than Tim Sansusi at how they handled the situation. I'm telling you that when the police came, they wanted to put me in trouble. Listen, here's a guy who was involved in the murder of a Plainville police officer. And for some reason, is Teflon. Nothing sticks to him. Nothing ever did. Sansusi sued Dennis Hernandez. A small claims judge ordered Dennis to pay him $350, and the matter seemed resolved. Although, Sansusi later crossed paths with Terry. What I remember her saying to me very clearly was, oh, I told Dennis he shouldn't have hit you. I told him next time, just spit at him. Tim would never see a dime of that $350. Still, his son stayed friends with Aaron. They began spending a lot of time together. Aaron had slept over at our house one time, I think when they were maybe, I just want to guess, maybe about 10 years old, you know. Their friendship lasted right through high school, where Dennis was the quarterback and Aaron, the wide receiver and linebacker, was the star. Me and him... <laughs> We used to love doing Oklahomas against each other because no one else could tackle him at times. Oklahomas are brutal blocking and tackling drills where two players go head to head. I shouldn't say that. We, there was tons of guys that threw their head around, but me and Aaron liked the competitive fireness. I gave him a little bit of a challenge and not everyone could. And on game day, there was really only one player he needed to get the ball to. It was very simple. Whatever the play was, you know, Aaron was read number one. Whatever route it was, I think my favorite uh, throw to him was a corner route. By this time, Aaron was a lot bigger than other players his age. He towered over teammates dressed in the school's maroon and white football uniforms. Opponents had no answer for him. I mean, he played tight end. He'd fake a post, go out to a corner, which I think was a seven and I just throw a nice lefty ball right over his shoulder, and it was smooth. The friendship meant a lot to Dennis. There's a photo of them in their tuxedos, hanging out at their junior prom. Aaron was a guy who was just a really good friend, too. He knew how to make people feel good, so uh, yeah, throwing him the football made me feel good as an individual. Aaron was one of the most popular kids in school. Good looking, outgoing, not given to bullying or too much bragging. He played varsity football as a freshman, and he excelled at basketball too. He also dated Cheyenne Jenkins, the girl who would one day be his fiance. As the years went on, he grew well past six feet tall with a sturdy build. He was a man among boys. But he always seemed to have a little kid inside of him, his brother Jonathan recalled. When the UConn football coach came to the house to recruit Jonathan, um, I remember my mom being a nervous wreck, you know, pacing. You know, she, she was a smoker, so she was smoking. She was a nervous woman, smoking her cigarettes. Oh, they were so frustrating. Me and Aaron used to hide them in the damn free freezer so she couldn't find them. Aaron could be shy, Jonathan remembers. He was like peeking outside of his window. He looked like a little turtle trying to come out of his shell. And he was like, 
like, is it okay to come in this living room? I'm like, like Aaron, get over here. Let's go, Edsel. Let's go, Edsel. It wouldn't be long before Edsel was courting Aaron, too. Like many kids his age, Aaron sometimes partied and drank. And he started smoking pot almost daily. Aaron came over to my house the first day of junior year. I'm quarterback. He's, he's you know, tight end. He's making it big. And we, we showed up. We walked up to uh, school from my house. I only lived like a couple uh, streets down. And we were, yeah, we were baked. In Aaron's breakout junior year at Bristol Central, Dennis Sansusi and Aaron Hernandez were one of the most prolific passing tandems in the state. Nine touchdown completions in the first four games. We kind of all knew, all the friends knew that Aaron was going to make it big because he deserved it. He worked very hard at it. He was a freaking hard worker at what he wanted, and he wanted to be a good football player. Dennis said he and Aaron smoked weed before practices, and Aaron later said he smoked before games. During their junior year, Dennis got caught and was kicked off the team for the rest of the season. Aaron never got disciplined. He kept playing. Aaron kept dominating on the football field and the basketball court, but his brother says he didn't get the praise he most wanted from his father. Aaron would score touchdowns or 40 points in a basketball game. When you win and your teammates, your coaches are all happy, but then you get home and it's a whole different story. In January of Aaron's junior year, that demanding environment would change very abruptly. His dad went in for what was said to be a routine hernia operation, but he never came home. He died days later from complications of the surgery at age 49. He was ruined. I mean, yeah, it it ruined Aaron. It ruined, ruined him. That's Dennis Sansusi. He didn't know how to even act anymore. No one knew how to control him. Hundreds of people came to pay their respects at Aaron's dad's wake. There was a line around the block. Dennis Hernandez was buried in St. Joseph Cemetery in Bristol on January 9th, 2006. The high school principal remembers Jonathan crying hard at the funeral. But he says Aaron remained completely stone-faced, holding in his emotions. When Jonathan headed back to college, Aaron had a much smaller family to rely on. He's a little child with no father. My mom has just lost her husband and going through her own emotional crisis. Afterwards, things took a downward spiral for Aaron. I was in college, and um, Aaron was home. He was there with my mother. And um, it was a completely different dynamic. His mother began dating a family friend named Jeffrey Cummings. He was married to Aaron's favorite cousin, Tanya. When Jeffrey Cummings moved into the Hernandez home, Terry gained a companion, but she virtually lost a son. Aaron started spending long stretches at his cousin Tanya's house on Lake Avenue in Bristol. By all accounts, it was a home with a lot of chaos, drinking, drug dealers, and drifters. It was also a place where Aaron came to feel loved and nurtured by Tanya. She was 15 years older than Aaron and became a kind of mother figure to him. She loved uh, Aaron, loved him to death. Um, He loved her. Um, She was a person in Aaron's life that he really looked up to. And she was really there since really, and she used to babysit us when, when we were in diapers. Tanya's house happened to be across the street from where another big influence on Aaron's life began, the field where he first played tackle football. There are job sites that send you tons of the wrong resumes to sort through. That's not smart. The last thing you need when you're looking for a candidate for your job is more work on your plate. But you know what is smart? Going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator to find your next great hire instead. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast. No more sorting through the wrong resumes, no more waiting for the right candidates to apply. 
It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. By the way, that number one rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. Right now, as a listener of this show, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash G-L-A-D-I-A-T-O-R. ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Late in an October game in 2006, his final season at Bristol Central, Aaron Hernandez and his teammates were playing Maloney High School of Meriden. Aaron was knocked down by a blindside hit to the head. He lay motionless before a hushed crowd. Lori Belmonte, a registered nurse, was watching from the stands. I saw him get hit, and I saw him go down. And he didn't get back up, and Aaron would always get back up. Then the coaches went out on the field, how many fingers, you know, that kind of thing. And he must have been totally out of it because the ambulance was standing by. The EMTs immediately came up on the field and got him and took him. At the time, scientists were just beginning to establish a link between blows to the head in football and the disease now known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. But much was still unknown. A month after Hernandez's concussion, former Philadelphia Eagles star Andre Waters would shoot himself to death at age 44. He was later diagnosed with CTE. Aaron's concussion sidelined him for one game. He came back the following week and finished out his senior season. He was named Connecticut's Gatorade Player of the Year. Aaron Hernandez was the best high school tight end in the nation. He'd received a trophy case worth of honors, including a coveted invitation to the U.S. Army All-American Bowl, a showcase for the nation's best high school seniors. His brother Jonathan, who was playing quarterback at UConn, went home to watch Aaron play. I remember the day I go home and see him you know, have this breakout game. It's just, uh, that's when it hit me. I was like, wow, he's doing things that I didn't even know could happen because I was never that good or been around that kind of talent to see. Jonathan wasn't the only one who could see Aaron's talent. Up until then, he'd seemed set to follow in his brother and father's footsteps by playing at UConn. I was like, listen, you can accomplish anything you want to and you can go anywhere. And I just said, listen, just, you know, I'm gl- we're really glad to have you at UConn. And it goes back to being a part of, you know, just me going around, seeing and being brothers, wanting to be together. Aaron verbally committed to Coach Edsel that he'd play football for UConn. But then... And Florida came up. The University of Florida was a bigger, more prestigious program, a top three team. The Gators weren't the only big name program that came calling. Notre Dame, Miami the University of Michigan. Nearly every elite team in the country reached out. Aaron planned a visit to Florida, and he seemed to be rethinking his options. I told him, listen, just be like, talk to me after you get home, let's talk. Jonathan says he wasn't against his brother going to Florida. He just wanted to talk first. And he wanted Aaron to keep his word to Coach Edsel. Instead... And all of a sudden I get a phone call. He's committed. And, um... Happened really fast. He chose to play for the national powerhouse in Gainesville. I was just upset that he didn't he didn't communicate with me and he didn't tell Coach Edsel before he committed to Coach Meyer and, and their staff. For Aaron, it was a big decision, just three months after so much devastating news in his family. He was 16 and about to embark on a big-time college football career, far from the troubles of home. Looking back, Jonathan thinks his brother was never comfortable with the person he saw in the mirror. He really struggled with the reflection because of a lot of things that have occurred in his life. And Aaron always wanted to prove something to his father. Remember the time in our you know, life where it's just, you know, he's like, I don't know what else I can do. I don't know if I can do anything. And he, it's like, is this the only thing I can do well because the person I look up to, it makes him the proudest. And 
Like, okay, if I do this, like maybe it'll bring this happiness that I've been searching for and seeking my entire life. Aaron's friend, Dennis Sansusi, remembers talking with him about his future plans one day after practice. His father had already passed away. We were in the car and he just, he opened up in many ways that I didn't really see before. And he was like, man, I want to be in the Hall of Fame. I'm going to do this. Like, Aaron was somebody who was dedicated to be the best of the best at his position. Aaron would be one of the best of his generation, if only briefly. Dennis Sansusi, meanwhile, was bound for the Marines. He says the two of them remained friends through Aaron's NFL career. Years later, in April 2017, Dennis recalls being home with his father. He started screaming in the house, and I woke up from it. The news was reporting Aaron's death in prison. It was a terrible shock. And there was more. As part of the reporting of the article that day, they said that Aaron had written three letters or a couple of letters, and that one of them was to his gay lover in prison. And my first reaction was that this can't even be true, that this has to be fake news, you know. Tim Sansusi was right, in a way. No such letter has ever come to light. But the news about a possible gay lover in prison started a conversation between father and son. Dennis revealed to his dad that his relationship with Aaron had also been sexual. But it was never a thing like, I, you're with me, I'm with you. We lived our own lives. We were homies. He says he and Aaron closely guarded their secret, especially from their dads. We didn't want people to know. And that's why it's hard for me to come out today and do this. But Before we talked to him, Dennis had never spoken publicly about this. But he says he feels like Aaron would want him to do this. I really, truly feel in my heart I got the thumbs up from him. So what anyone else says, I just don't give a damn. Back in the day, he was frowned upon. Still in society, got a negative stigmatism. We were all good athletes who liked women no hesitation about that. So yeah, it's a lot to overcome. And that's why I say it was a trickle down effect into the Marine Corps. That's like now a man's man's group and you're you're trying to hide something just like Aaron was. You know, all the tattoos, that stuff, that didn't seem like Aaron to me. I have tattoos too, but he wasn't someone who seemed like he was going down the road of getting all those tattoos, but I realized as someone who's bisexual now too, he had to go different routes to try and show his authority because Aaron was an alpha and Aaron got what he wanted in life. And I don't see anything wrong with that. It's taken a long time for Dennis's father to be comfortable with his son's sexuality. When Dennis was younger, Tim bought him a poster. Everybody's familiar with a poster of this kind. It's of the three girls in the, you know, string bikinis with the rollerblades on, uh, rollerblading down the beach, right? And I thought to myself, I would poster up their room with with some of that stuff. And um, uh, and that, and that when they went to sleep at night, that's what they'd look at. And, and, and because that's what they were looking at at night, it would somehow make them uh, heterosexual. And, and and of course, I thought it worked. Listen, I'm a foolish person. Uh, I've found out and in, in have been, uh, I've been wrong about everything in my life. When Tim first learned about Aaron's sexuality after the suicide, he immediately thought of what Dennis Hernandez would think. His father's got to be rolling over in his grave. I mean, Aaron's dad was a man's man, as far as I knew. He was a guy's guy. He was uh, a tough guy in some sense, you know. Since his brother's death, Jonathan Hernandez says he spent a lot of time thinking about the childhood experiences he and Aaron had and what role they played in his brother's life. I think without writing, um, I don't know, writing and, and, and you know, people, I, I don't know if I would be here today. 
I mean, it was my uh, ability to express. Uh, I said a lot of it was held in. Um, this book was um, the hardest thing I've ever done. <sighs> Going back to times in your life where uh, it just hurt thinking about. He says he's still processing a lot of what happened. Aaron didn't have as much time to sort out his past. As far as his brother knows, Aaron never had any counseling or therapy. He says they were raised to think that would be a sign of weakness. In early 2007, Aaron Hernandez would leave the turmoil of his life in Bristol and head down south. He wouldn't finish his senior year, he wouldn't go to prom, and he wouldn't be part of all the graduation celebrations. Arrangements were being made for him to graduate high school a whole semester early so he could get a jump on the coming football season. He would arrive in Florida to play on college football's biggest stage. And almost right away, he would find himself in trouble. That's next time on Gladiator. From the Boston Globe and Wondery, this is part two of six of Gladiator, an investigative series from the Spotlight team about Aaron Hernandez and Football Inc. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. And thank you. Jonathan Hernandez's new memoir about his brother is called The Truth About Aaron. Gladiator was written, reported, and hosted by me, Bob Holler, and by Beth Healy, Sasha Pfeiffer, Andrew Ryan, and our Spotlight editor, Patricia Wen. You can also read the print series of Gladiator at bostonglobe.com slash gladiator. We'd also like to give special thanks to Globe editors Brian McGrory, Scott Allen, Mark Morrow, and Janice Page, Spotlight's data specialist Todd Wallach, and reporter Maria Kramer. Gladiator was produced by Amy Padula, sound designed by Jeff Schmidt, executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louis and Hernan Lopez for Wondery.